in only one name, and that is the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. To whom every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord of all. And thank you for the privilege that we are able to draw near to your throne of grace. Now in this moment, that we know we are not separated from you in any way, but we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Thank you that we can stand before your throne of grace boldly and proclaim how great is our God. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you loved us first. And thank you that tonight that we can surrender our hearts to you. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and move in this place, that you will restore, renew, rebuild, bring new revival in our hearts as we spend time in your word. Thank you that you change us from glory to glory into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we honor you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Can we praise God? Hallelujah. Amen. Can we also thank the worship team? Amen. Thank you. You are welcome to take your seats. Welcome. It's good to see all of you here this evening. Uh, what a great, wonderful, warm day we had. Wow, it was so cold today. It was a fun day. Yeah, freezing cold. It's great to see all of you here. Will you please do me a favor and take out your smart device or your cell phone, whatever you want to use, and um, let's go to our Calvary Chapel app. By the way, if you don't have the app yet, it looks like that. You can get it on the App Store, on the Play Store, and it will really help you connect with everything that we are busy with here at Calvary Chapel Hillsborough. So first of all, let's go to our serving opportunities. We have many opportunities to serve in the church. Um, and the one we are highlighting this week is our midweek cleaning team. So as many of you know, we have a Wednesday evening service as well. And by the way, we also eat at that service as we did tonight. Can we also thank the people that made the food tonight? What a wonderful, it's great to be able to fellowship together. And... Um, so we have a midweek cleaning team that comes in and they're on a rotational basis. It isn't a big thing, it doesn't take a lot of time um, to clean up and get ready for the services on Wednesday. So if you want to get involved with that, you have some free time on your hand, you want to serve somewhere in this body, you're welcome to click on that link, fill out the form, and we will get you in touch with the people that sets up that schedule and get you plugged into that. Then also we added a new tab on the app that says growth groups. Um, and we have quite a few growth groups that are going to start up in a few weeks. Now, this is small groups, people that come together in groups in specific areas um, and cons they handle or look at specific topics. There are many to choose from, so please go through the list. There are ones that are continual, ones that are for a few weeks, and there are even ones that are already fully booked and ones with waiting lists. So you've, you, there are those that you cannot get into. Go look at all the others, get plugged in. This is such a great place to grow in Christ. Don't miss out on that. Sign up on the church app or on our website. Let's then go to our highlighted events. And um, just before we get to that, just a reminder, we have our Saints Alive Bring and Share this Thursday, January the 19th from 12 to 2 p.m. So that's all our senior citizens that get together, have a wonderful time together, bring and share, bring something, eat and fellowship. And um, uh, by the way, my wife and I are visiting you there this week, so we're going to talk a bit and have a great time and just fellowship with you guys as well. I hope you all come now, um, don't stay away, uh, but that's going to be fun. We can't wait to spend the time with you. Let's go to highlighted events, and the first one is our young adults night in the alley, and um, we have missional groups, young adults missional groups all over the area, and um, every now and then they come together, spend a great time together of fellowship and fun, and they've got one planned for January the 27th at 6.30 here at Park Lanes Family Center, going to go bowling, and everything is included, your shoes and your lane fee and everything, so get involved with that group. It's great to be connected with a group of young adults that have the same mindset, same values, a safe space to have great fun. Just come and enjoy it. Um, click on the link, sign up for that on the highlighted events and you'll really enjoy that. Then also coming up is our Calvary Students Winter Retreat and that is from February 10th to 12th at Eagle Fern Camp. 
That's for all our middle school and high school students. Cost is $100 per student, and the registration is open until January the 25th. This is a great time for our kids to just step out of the world and out of all the pressures of this world and spend time at the feet of Jesus while also having a lot of fun. Really encourage your kids to go. Parents, sign them up. This is a life-changing event for your kids. Don't miss out on this. Then we're also kicking, up a, a kicking off a program, Multiply. It's a small discipleship group for men, where there are two to three men together, one mentor and two disciples or people discipling each other. And um, they sign up and just spend time helping and mentoring each other through the things that men sometimes struggle with in this world. As iron sharpens iron, so we sharpen each other. And we need to be accountable towards other people. A great, great program where they cover um, many effective topics, relevant topics, uh, keeping you grounded in what God's plan is for us as men. Please sign up for that on the app or the website. Then also, it's... Uh, getting to that time where everyone is busy with their taxes. So if you want to um, get reports from all your gifts, uh, all your tithes, you can go into your CCB, into the Church Community Builder app on our website, and you can click on member, or you can go on the app as well. And you can pull all your reports that is needed for this time of year. If you struggle with that, uh, you need some help. We have tech support standing by. You can phone the church office, and we will gladly help you to uh, log into that and get all the necessary info that you need. Then while we're at that space, um, this is also the place where you can register your account if you don't have one yet. You can go on the app uh, or you can go to our website, calvaryhillsboro.org, and register um, on our app to get more info uh, on what's happening at the church. It's also very good for or effective for giving. So you know by now, if you're in the sanctuary, we don't have ushers coming to take up the gifts. We have uh, boxes at the back, the agape donation boxes, and you can drop your gifts, um, donations, or tithes in there. But also, if you don't have cash, or you don't carry cash anymore in this age and time, or you're online watching us, you can also click on the app, uh, register an account, and you can... Uh, you can set up a continual gifting on there and keep track of that as well. And God bless you so much for that. That's all the announcements I have for tonight. Are you ready to get into the Word? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we worship you. Thank you for your Word. Thank you that we can spend time in your Word, bathing in your Word as you wash us and we experience you just changing us more and more into who we want to be and who we need to be. Thank you that you change our hearts tonight as well. As your word washes over our hearts, that we are changed and transformed into the image of Christ. And we honor you for that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are breathing over every heart in this place and that you are bringing new truth, new revelation, and that you are setting free from the lies of the enemy. We honor you for that in Jesus' name. Everybody says... Amen. Well, we are in Acts 10, and I'm just loving going through Acts. I don't know about you. That's the place where you say, yes, we do. <laughs> I'm just uh, loving going through Acts again, just seeing everything that's happening and what God is doing in the church. And it's so many relevant things that we can apply to our lives as well. And my title for tonight is God loves a seeking heart. God loves a seeking heart. And we're continuing in Acts 10, where we last week we were speaking about the outflow of a God-seeking heart. The next step is to have a heart to hear what God wants and what God is busy doing. God loves a seeking heart. Because when you seek God, when you seek His heart, He wants to pour out more of Himself so that your life is transformed into a beautiful life, into a life that focuses on God's plan and God's purpose. See, ultimately, God's heart is that we will have a personal relationship with Him more and more, flowing in connection with His heart and with his spirit. So just as a bit of a background, as we stepped into Acts 10 last week, um, it's all about bringing the gospel to the Gentile world, which we, as you know, are part of. If you're not a Jew, 
You're a Gentile. And by the grace of God, he has also opened it up to the Gentile world. But at that stage, when the, when the disciples were busy spreading the word and the gospel, they saw it as a Jewish thing. When they went to the outer areas of the world, as Jesus said, go to all the world, they were thinking we were going to the Jews, never thinking of the Gentiles. But God had a plan to spread the word to all people. So for this to happen, God had to change their hearts. God had to change their perspective, the way that they saw what God wanted to do. And God would begin with Peter. So if you would remember last week, um, we saw that Peter was praying and there was like this linen cloth coming from heaven in a vision. And um, he saw all these unclean animals and God told him, kill and eat. He said, God, I cannot do this. God told him three times and pulled it up again. So he was perplexed, but then he understood as he heard that Cornelius' servants were coming to get him to speak to Cornelius in his household, he got the message. And he understood that God didn't want him to call unclean that which God says could be cleaned. So this was not a vision about food we saw. This was about people. And it's a great lesson for all of us. God does not show partiality. Isn't that amazing? That God is accepting of everyone, and neither should we. We shouldn't look down on anyone. God's love and His grace is offered freely to every man and every woman. You see, God didn't look at the Jewish people when He chose them and said, Oh, you are so amazing. You are so cute. You are so great. You do nothing wrong. I'm going to choose you as my people. No, that's not why he chose them. In fact, Deuteronomy 7, 7, Moses said to the people, Israel, he said, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were greater in number than the other nations, for you were the least of all people. The least of all people? See, God chose Israel and poured out his favor because their father, Abram, was a man of faith who honored God with his, with his life. So Moses continued when he told him in Deuteronomy 7, no, 9, 7 verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God. He keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to the thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's why God blessed them. Also, God chose and blessed them because he wanted to show his grace and his majesty that that might become visible. You see, if God would have chosen the biggest nation on earth and they said, listen, listen, I want to be your God now, they would say, we're the biggest nation on earth. We can do whatever we want. But God chose those who looked insignificant on this earth, in worldly standards, so that he can show his majesty and his grandeur through them. Where do I see that? Isaiah 41 verse 14 says, Do not fear, you worm Jacob. This is God speaking. Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. God uses those that look insignificant on this world to show his majesty and his glory. Now, an example of maybe a wrong attitude, which Peter didn't have, is the example of Jonah. You know the story. God told Jonah to go to the Assyrian city of Nineveh, but he didn't like the Assyrians at all. He said, I would love to see them destroyed. But God said, go to Nineveh. I want to save those people. I want you to see that these were Gentile people. Even in the Old Testament, God's heart was to save those who were far off. But what did Jonah do? He said, no, 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 I don't want to do this. So he ran down to Joppa. He he got on a ship and he went in the wrong direction. You know the story. So there was a storm. They cast lots. He was the guy that was the culprit. He said, it's me. God's trying to sort me out. And uh, they threw him overboard. A big fish gobbled him up, swam with him to the coast of the Assyrian coast and vomited him out on the beach. 
and there is Jonah. So now he has to go to the city of Nineveh. And he goes in and he says, well, you better repent because God's going to destroy you all. And he goes through the city telling him the story and then he goes to the mountaintop to see this happen. He can't wait for them to be destroyed. But then these people come in sackcloth and they come and repent and they bow their knees before God and they all are saved. See, his heart was wrong. But we see a contrast here. I want you to see something. Where was Peter when he saw this vision? Also in Joppa. He was also in the same city. But he didn't run and get on a ship and go away from where God was sending him. No, his heart was right. Because he had a heart that wanted to follow God. We need the right attitude. We see this also with Jesus. When he walked past Matthew and he said, tonight I want to eat with you. A tax collector? Eat with a sinner, Jesus? And then Matthew, he called all his sinner friends. And Jesus was reclining and eating with them. And the Pharisees said, how can you do this? These are sinners. And Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. So in this story also, we're going to see that God is changing history through hearts that hear and seek him. And we're also going to see some principles that can apply to our lives, how we can change our hearts and the outflow of that. So let's get into the word. And um, we will be reading from Acts 10 and from verse 23. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So now these people are taking him to the house of Cornelius. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. By the way, this was not a law given by God. This was a law made up by the Jewish leaders. This was not from God. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask for what reason you have sent for me. Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come to me. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, you yourselves know the things which, which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on the cross. So God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. 
Now, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. We're going to read up to there. God bless his wonderful word. The first principle we see is that we need to be eager to hear. Be eager to hear. We first met Cornelius earlier in this chapter, and um, he's an officer of the Roman army, a centurion. So this means that he's the kind of person that Peter would never associate with. He would want nothing to do with him. He was part of the enemy. But he had a good heart, and he was eager to hear. Now, as a typical Roman centurion, he would have been... Um, uh, exposed to all the Roman gods, but he discovered Jehovah, the God of Israel, and he became devoted to him. His heart was already longing after God, and he was generous towards the Jews, and he had a faithful prayer life. That's something interesting to stop at tonight, having a faithful prayer life. Now, Cornelius, he was hungry for the truth, and he was sincerely seeking after God. He had a heart that was eager to hear. And God loves a heart that seeks after him. And we see also that the right heart has a powerful influence. While Cornelius was waiting for Peter to come, he gathered all his friends and all his, his family and relatives. And right away, we can see the influence that he had. See, they saw him, the type of man that he was. They saw that he was a good man, upstanding man, with a good character, a devout person. And they knew that they could follow this man. This was a man of integrity. If he said, something is coming that you need to hear, they made sure that they were there. His heart and his life was the influence. And here's the principle. God certainly uses pastors and evangelists. But you know where God uses people the most powerfully? Is He's using everyone that's in their place, in the marketplace, all of us, all of you, where you are to influence people. Because the influence flows from the right heart. And when your heart is right, it will change the perception of people. And they will be drawn unto Christ. Most people are saved because of the influence of a friend. Because see, Peter would never be able to connect with all those people on his own. But here was Cornelius gathering them, his influence sphere. And immediately there was an audience to the news of Christ. All of us have the ability to influence people for Christ. And I want to tell you, I've seen this many times. Sometimes when people live for Jesus and they stand on the truth, stand in integrity, not being judgmental, but living a life of a good heart, sometimes they are ridiculed. They're ridiculed at their work, ridiculed between their friends. But you know what? People are looking at you. They are looking at what you do, how you react, how you handle situations. Where does your hope come from? What are, what are you grounded in? And I've seen this many times that the same people that ridicule you, when they go through tough times, they come to you and they say, I see that you are a man or a woman of God. Please pray with me. Because outwardly they're trying to be these big shots. Proudly walking around. I don't need anything. But inwardly they are seeking. And as you are living a life of testimony. The spirit of God is moving on their hearts. We should never stop 
trusting and believing God that he wants to use us. See, here's the point. Have the right heart and then influence people with how you live. And many people, especially young people, they say, but the peer pressure is so tough. And you know what I, I discovered when I was young, and I thank God for this, for this revelation. I had the privilege to grow up in a church that was a Bible teaching church that loved Jesus with the Spirit of God, was welcome. And from a young age, I understood that greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. You know what? I make a point of it when people tell me, come on, are you a sissy? Why don't you drink with us? Then I make a point of it not to drink with them. Because they don't define who I am. Their acceptance cannot define who I am. It is God who defines who I am. And that's why David could say, with my God, I will jump a wall. I will storm a troop. Even if a thousand falls on my left hand and 10,000 on my right hand, I will not be shaken. For greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Do you know that you are never alone? You are never alone. You are never in the minority. Because the God of the angel armies and the commander of the angel armies is on your side. We should be the peer pressure by living our lives in integrity. Because that will change people. People are looking for those who have backbone that will stand up for what is right. Stand up for peace and justice and love. God is with us. We don't have to be afraid. And we see this in the story of Gideon. You remember that story? So Gideon was afraid because the enemy was raiding all of their towns. And the Bible says that he was ba busy um, threshing the wheat. Is that what you call it? Yeah. He was doing that, but in the wine press. You know what? You normally don't do it in the wine press. You do it on a hill where there is some wind so the chaff can be blown. He was afraid. So he was doing it in the wine press where the enemy could not see him. And in that state, the angel came to him and said these words, Judges 6, 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And Gideon's like, where is this guy? Am I in the way? Can I step out of the way? Who's this guy? He said, I'm speaking to you. He says, this cannot be. I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the, the youngest and the smallest and the weakest in my father's house. How can this be? God says, but I see something in you. Mighty warrior. And God uses him to show God's glory. Whittles down his army, you remember, to 300 people. Because it's not about your power. It's about greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Because see, we cannot just walk, uh, go along with a crowd in this worldly system. It will destroy you. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It will change you. We need to stand on the word. We need to stand securely in who God says we are. You know this foundational scripture, Luke 6, 44, 45. We quote it so many times. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. It's all about the heart. But you need to hear with a humble and a teachable heart. Because we see when Peter entered, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. I want you to see this picture. It's like you walking into the Pentagon, into a colonel's office, and the moment you walk in, he falls on his feet and says, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Falls on his knees. You just don't see this happen. This is a man of authority. And now he bows, goes down on his knees in front of Peter, centurion of the Roman army. See, being humble and teachable is part of a good heart. And God honors this. 
God honors him because of this. James 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. See, people have it the wrong way around. People want to be lifted up by this world, but that will break you down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This week I was, sometimes when it's cold like this, I'm so thankful for central heating, aren't you? When it was, we had that cold spell, our central heating was broken. And we were away for two days. And when we got back into the house, it was 43 degree, degrees in the house. I said, oh my word, this is cold. And then I, I switched it on, uh, the HVAC on when it got fixed. And um, our house downstairs and upstairs, maybe your house is the same, but downstairs is the thermostat. So when you switch it on and put it to 68 or whatever, there's very few vents at the bottom. But in the top, it gets hot very quickly. And then downstairs, it's not 67 down here, yet it's 80 upstairs already. So to get this thing, it's quite interesting. But that made me think how fragile are we are as humans. We get discomfort with such a small degree in variance of heat and cold. What can you survive in? Minus 50 Fahrenheit up to 150? I don't know. Without clothes? Without the proper clothing, not even that. Yet, if we look at the temperature of the sun, it is 15 million degrees on the center and 10,000 degrees on the surface. And you know what the Bible says? We serve the God that breathes out stars. Yeah. Oh my word, how great is our God. And yet people have the audacity to stand proudly before God and wanting to reason with him and say, God, I think I, I don't think I want to do what you say I have to do. Who do we think we are? God is God. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And here's the thing, you will be humbled. Because if you don't humble yourself before the Lord, then this world and the enemy will humble you and destroy you. Thank God that he is there to pick up the pieces. But you will be humbled. And if you don't want to humble yourself before the Lord, one day you will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the weight of his glory will make you go on your knees and say, how great thou art. Why not humble ourselves now? Why be proud now? Because James 4 verse 6 says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Grace, that's what I want. I never want the God that breathes stars to resist me. Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm dust. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How do you humble yourself? By putting a guard on your heart and your thoughts that you keep, that will keep you where God wants you to be. Because see what the heart, the flesh wants to do is it wants to raise the heart up in pride. To make the hard heart proud. So if God says something, for example, uh, I want you to do this. The heart wants to say, the flesh says, no, 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 don't do this. I want to stand against God. Or you can even swap it around. If God tells you, you're a great warrior, the heart will tell oh, you're useless. You cannot do this. You see, our heart is playing, and it's the lies of the enemy that's playing tricks on us all the time. And therefore, we need to guard our hearts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We destroy it. Every thought and lofty thing raising itself against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You can take it captive. If the enemy tells you you're a loser, you can say, I take this captive in Jesus' name. This is not the truth. I am more than an overcomer in Jesus. We need to take the thoughts captive. But for that, you need to surrender your life to God, recognize Him as the highest authority in your life because He 
knows best. Stand under his authority. Now, there are times that we need to pull ourselves from our high horse and say, get off this horse, let go of your pride, humble yourself. But there are also times that we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Do you know you have the ability to talk to yourself? Now you're saying, Pastor, do you think I should walk around in the street talking to myself? That's an interesting concept. No, you could do it in your car or somewhere. Don't be weird. <laughs> but the other day I was driving to work and um, you know what? We all experience pressure and troubles and thoughts and things. And deadlines and budgets and all these things that's running through your mind. And as I was driving to work, all, we had all these things running into my mind. It didn't want to oppress my soul. And I literally started speaking loudly to myself. Say, stop this now in Jesus' name. This is not the truth. God is with me. God is in control of my life. Greater is he that's in me that's he that's in the world. My God is with me. Who can be against me? Rejoice for the steps of the righteous are ordered of God. Thank you, God, that you order my steps. Start to speak to yourself. And you sometimes need to do it loudly so that your thoughts can be quieted down. You say you're crazy. No, I'm not. I get this from Scripture. Psalm 43 verse 5 says, and this guy is speaking to himself. Why so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. You can talk to yourself. Just don't be weird. Do it somewhere. Not loudly in the street. See, we need to take captive these thoughts that the enemy wants to keep us captive with. Now, let's go on. Peter sees Cornelius is bow bowing down. Immediately, he raises him up and says, listen, I'm also just a man. Don't bow in front of me. But then we see Peter's humble heart and his teachable heart. In verse 26, when he says, God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Do you know what a big paradigm shift this was for Peter? He wouldn't even eat. He wouldn't, wouldn't even greet a Gentile. God changes his heart. Also in verse 34, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Salvation is available to everyone. But then he continues and he says that there is a condition to this. Salvation is available to those who fear him. In other words, those who stand in awe of him, those who understand their relation towards God, recognizing him as God. The one, he continues to say, who does what is right. No point in just recognizing God and then continuing and saying, I don't want to do what he says, I'll do my own thing. Doing what is right. What is the right thing? The right thing is turning to Christ, surrendering to Jesus, recognizing him. That is a heart that is right before God, a humble heart. Then Peter continues and he speaks to them about Jesus. All the proofs of Jesus. He remembers that moment when God said on the Mount of Transfiguration, said, this is my son. Listen to him. It is all about Jesus. It's about him. So in verse 33, Cornelius tells him, we're all here to hear what you are saying. What a receptive audience. What an amazing thing. I must tell you, as a pastor, I have spoken to many crowds. I've spoken to crowds that are resistant and negative and judgmental. And it's very difficult to speak to such a crowd. But it's wonderful to speak to a crowd who is accepting in joy. It's like a sponge saying, I have a heart after God. I want to know God. I want to be drenched in the presence of God's Spirit and His Word. What a wonderful place. And that's what he's experiencing. He now gives them the gospel to these Gentiles. And this sermon will change history. No longer will the gospel be only to the Jews, but this will spread to the ends of the earth. And he tells them, this is the one, Jesus, this is the one, sent 
by God. He starts in verse 36 saying, The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Let's stop there. Peace. We see, without a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there cannot be true and lasting peace in the heart. We have to get this settled first. Ephesians 2 verse 17 to 18 says, He, Jesus, came and preached peace to those of you who were far away, the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, Israel. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. See, Peter then explains to them that peace comes when we experience forgiveness of our sins. This is the foundation of the gospel. The good news that God sent for us to hear. We cannot have a relationship to God until our sins are forgiven because our sins separate us from God. Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 2. The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. How does this work practically? I submit to you that many times anxiety and fear can be traced back to people feeling separated from God. Because when people are separated from God, they try and find their peace with other people. And other people can never satisfy. And that brings anxiety. Am I good enough? That brings fear. Will I be rejected? Will I be rejected by God? It's like a ship that's in the middle of the ocean and you're on the ship. And there's no rudder and there's no sail and there's no land in sight. There's no hope. Because your heart is not at peace with God. That brings anxiety. That brings fear. Because see, sin becomes a hindrance between you and God. When you still live in sin, God is holy. You cannot be close to God. You will be destroyed. It steals your confidence to draw near. And I thought of another illustration. Imagine you're, you're a soldier in the army and you're in a massive battle and there's mortars flying and bombs and everything. And you're alone and suddenly your communication is cut off. You don't know where you are. You don't know what the plan is. You cannot speak to your commander. You don't know if they've left you. Are they coming to get you? You don't know what's happening. The fear and anxiety is overwhelming. And that's what happens when you feel that you are disconnected from God. There's a wonderful antidote to this though. A promise we can take hold of. Hebrews 4 verse 15 to 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Can I see your hand if you have weaknesses? I'll raise my hand for everyone. And sometimes we feel that our weaknesses are keeping us from God. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, praise God, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. It's by the goodness of God. Draw near to that place so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The answer is not to run from God when you're struggling with something. The answer is run to God. We run to him even in our weaknesses because when we are weak, there we go, he is strong. The saddest thing is to see people who are hurting. And you know what? You can see it. But they have built up a wall of pride because they don't want to hurt anymore. Don't want to let anyone in. Don't even want to let God in. Because they're scared to get hurt anymore. And they built up a wall of pride and you cannot get in. But see, as you surrender and come in agreement with God, laying down your iniquity, say, God, I'm struggling with this. God, help me. 
He restores you and the Holy Spirit strengthens you and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and he grounds you in the love of Jesus Christ. You then discover that you are deeply loved. I love the scripture. 1 John 4, 18 to 19. There is no fear in love. Only God has perfect love. He will never leave you. Never forsake you, never show you a way, never say you are too bad. He says, come, I love you. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. Thank God that Jesus took the punishment on the cross when he said, it is finished. The one who fears is not perfected in love. If you're still stuck in fear, stuck in anxiety, go to Jesus and let him reveal through his spirit His love for you. He loves you. Then Peter continues, not going to stand on this for very long because we've been through this, but he then continues to explain all the evidences of that Jesus was the Messiah. Firstly, he said in Luke 9.35 that God says, He is this my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. He says that God also gave the signs of the times through the prophets. There were all these prophecies of what Jesus would do. Heal the lame, heal the sick, Raised the dead to life. Jesus did that. And then lastly, that God raised him up on the third day. And there were witnesses to this. He says, you all know. As he was speaking to them, he says, you know I'm not lying. You know all this. And you know people who have seen this. You know people who have eaten with him. This could not be refuted. Jesus was raised from the dead. Then he goes on. And he quotes something, and I'm first going to read Acts 17, 30 to 31. He says, Having overlooked times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And this is exactly what Peter says in verse 32. He says that Jesus is appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. He will judge one day. But first, he says, he is not only the judge, but he's also the one offering forgiveness of sin. Jesus said, I did not come to judge the world. I came to save the world. The first time he came as the lamb that was slain to save the world. We are in a dispensation of grace. Until that day when the father says, it's time. When Jesus comes back, he will then come back as the one to judge the world. And this is not a popular message today. But I want to tell you there is a heaven and there is a hell. And there will be a day when you will stand before someone. And this might not be a politically correct thing to say, and many churches shy away from it now. But the Bible tells us that there is sin and there is life. And you can choose God or you can choose against God. You can choose Jesus or you can choose against him. You will choose where you go. And on that day when you stand before that King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who spoke everything into existence by a word, you will not be able to bargain. It will only be one question. Do you know my son? Have you received him as Lord and Savior in your life? Have you accepted his gift of forgiveness and salvation? then you have to be correct regarding the one whom God has sent. Because see, God's heart for us is now, in this moment, in this time, on this earth now, to receive the life and the power of God. As we see in the story, as Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on them. It's as if God was waiting and saying, okay, I'm waiting. I'm ready. They need to hear. And when they've got the gist of this, I'm there. God wasn't reluctantly saving them. God couldn't wait to get in relationship with them so that his spirit can transform their lives. Peter was still on point three of six points. And God said, that's enough. Baptized him with his spirit. 
The moment that you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and surrender your life, His Spirit is available to you. And as you surrender to His Spirit, He comes to live inside of you and He becomes the power that transforms. Now, when you ask Jesus into your heart and you're born again, what next? Because see, I've heard people say before, I've tried this Jesus thing for a week and it doesn't work. That's like a grade one pupil going to school and after a week coming to his mom and say, this isn't working. I cannot read yet. I cannot write yet. I'm not the captain of the debate team yet. I cannot do calculus. No, my son, you need time. You need to build in the blocks of faith. Build a foundation. Build the foundation of your life on Jesus Christ. That's why I love these growth groups that we have. If you want to build a foundation of faith, get involved. Spend time in the Word. And as I spend time in the Word, the Spirit of God transforms me. Zechariah 4 verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. See, our focus changes. We now no longer build our lives on our own might, our own power, our own abilities, our own talents. My life isn't built on that anymore. Now, as a side note, this doesn't mean that it's not important. Because God uses that. God redeems that. God uses your gifts and your talents for His glory. Because ultimately, everything comes from Him. But now the efficiency and the results, just like with Gideon, comes through the working of the power of God's Spirit inside of us. As we surrender to Him. That's why we can live in peace. It's not about straining anymore to be a good Christian. It is God. I'm going to live in peace. You are changing me. You're taking me through stuff. You're taking me through situations. You're teaching me. You're in control. You know what you're doing. See, God's desire for us is to live a life in relationship with Him, led by His Spirit, so that we can navigate through this life effectively to do what we need to do. God is calling on your heart. God is calling us to hear if you have a seeking heart. And my question is, do you have a heart to hear and a heart to respond? See, I close with this. In Revelation, we read the part where Jesus is standing at the door and he knocks. You know that? And that is written to the whole church. That's true. But that's also written to us personally. And... Uh, you know, some of the doors, the front doors to houses has a door. And then there's like a little window on the side. You know that? So as you knock, you can see, are the people home? Are they ignoring me? See, Jesus is knocking at the door, but he knows where you are. He knows you're home. He's knocking at the door, but there are people that's inside and saying, I don't want to answer now, Jesus. But please keep knocking. Don't go away. But I don't want to answer now. Why? Because what he wants is to come in and dine with you. He wants to touch there where it is hurting. There where you struggle. In your inner sanctum. He wants to bring peace. But people want him to stay outside the door. Maybe in 20 years, Jesus. Please keep knocking. I want to tell you, you might have three seconds left or 30 years left. And this is not to scare anyone because the point is not to accept Jesus through fear so that I will not go to hell. I spoke about it last week. It's like the green card marriage. Remember that? Those who were here. You cannot do a green card marriage with Jesus just to get to heaven. You need a relationship with him. You need to open the door so that he can come in and dine with you. So that you can look into his eyes and you can see his love. Experience his forgiveness. Experience his compassion. He wants to change you from the inside out. Let's have a heart that seeks God. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we just want to thank you for who you are. Thank you that you never give up on us. 
Lord, even at times when we are prideful, times when we are resistant, even at times when we think we know best, want to follow our own hearts, thank you that you keep knocking. God, tonight we want to come to you and just surrender. I want to pray for every person in this place that are filled with anxiety, filled with fear, filled with insecurities, filled with hurt. Thank you that you are the healer. You are the prince of peace. You are the lover of our souls. And you will never let us go. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will move over our hearts more and more. And Lord, even if there are people in this place tonight that say there is iniquities between me and God, how can God forgive me? Thank you that you promise in your word that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. And you are not a man that you can lie. What you say is true. Thank you that tonight that we can run into your arms of love. And Lord, we want to surrender our hearts. Even those of us who follow you, many times our hearts get, get drawn to other directions and we want to bring our hearts back to a seeking heart. That we will have a heart like Cornelius. I want more of you, more of your spirit, more of your presence. Because in your presence is fullness of life and fullness of joy. We honor you for that in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Have a seeking heart. We're going to worship. And church, this is part of a seeking heart, is leaning into worship.